All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 20th day of October in the year of our Lord, 2022. And it's a dark day indeed, not because of what's going on in Ukraine or Russia or even Washington, but because of what's going on in the church. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the flame of that gospel is going out in many churches. The apostasy is here. Ministers of Satan to public acclaim, who are renowned as scholars, proclaim false gospels openly, and nobody notices. I have to continue with that short video by John Piper, who is a minister of Satan. He is. There's, he is unregenerate. Just read the intro to Desiring God. It's very clear this man was not born again. And he went seeking to satisfy his flesh. But John Piper is a very intelligent and clever man. So he's able to justify himself. He doesn't need Christ. He can just spin things. And because he is unsaved, he is a tool of Satan. He's a child of the devil. As Jesus said of some Pharisees, you are of your father the devil. And the deeds of your father you will do. He was a liar from the beginning. And when he speaks, when he lies, he lies out of his own nature. They were unregenerate. They did not have Christ in them. They did not have the Spirit of God in them. They did not have the love of truth in them. And so it is of Mr. Piper. I want to be up front. Piper's up front about what he believes. The very title here. We need to reconsider this preaching of the gospel stuff. Too much focus on the preaching of the gospel. My experience in Christian churches is the gospel is seldom proclaimed from the pulpit. It at most is added on at the end. While the preachers go off and preach moralizing principles to live by, how to have a better marriage, how to be a better employee or employer. Excuse me, if I go to church, I want to hear Christ and him crucified. You can take your opinions and stick them someplace, just not in my head. All right, so let's look at the seriousness of this issue. Now, I have to say, as I've seen this and th thought about what I've been seeing among the Nazarenes and how their semi-official position is not Christ crucified for our sins, but some screwball replacement for that called the governmental theory. Those who believe that have no salvation because they have no atonement. Their sins are unregenerate. They're, they're unforgiven because they do not believe in what Christ did on the cross. They do not believe that Christ paid for their sins in full. Just like Catholics that are taught that they have to pay at least part of the price of their sins by suffering in this world or the next. That's what purgatory is about. Yeah, they got to pay the temporal punishment. Unless they die without grace and then they go to hell. Otherwise, it's only 10 or 20 or 100,000 years in purgatory. As if, how can your suffering, 
How can your suffering, the suffering of a guilty sinner, pay for his sin? Can't. How much is enough payment? The wages of sin is death. If you're not atoned for, that means death forever, not cessation of existence, being cut off from a right relationship with God forever. In other words, you abide forever as the enemy of God, as long as God abides. He doesn't get over it because you trampled underfoot the blood of Jesus Christ by rejecting him, his salvation, his cross, his shedding his blood for you. So let's turn over to Galatians. You know, Paul blows a gasket, and so do I. We'll start at verse 6 of Galatians chapter 1. Skip the pleasantries, which are very few in this book. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. There's only one gospel. There is no other gospel. There's only one. That Christ, the Son of God, came, lived a sinless life, and died a vicarious, substitutionary death. And I know I'm repeating. In your place, paying the penalty for your sins. The wages of sin is death, and Christ died for us and rose again from the dead as proof he paid for your sin. If you do not believe that, you have not believed on Christ. Which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Yes, that's exactly what we're talking about perverting the gospel of Christ, devaluing the gospel of Christ, twisting the gospel of Christ, drawing attention to themselves, making disciples of themselves rather than of Jesus Christ, and in, engaging in exactly the same twisted gospel that the, uh, the false teachers at Galatia were pushing, a gospel of faith plus works. Plus works. Let's see, what does Paul say? about this other gospel that is not a gospel at all. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you other than we preach to you, let him be accursed, anathema, delivered up to God for God to destroy. As we have said before, now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you other than that which you have received, let him be accursed. That's a command, by the way. Regard him as accursed. It's not a suggestion. For do I now persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? If I still pleased man, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. And he talks about the gospel that he had received and proclaimed to them. And then in Galatians chapter 5, starting at verse 1, after having explained this, how we're, we, we stand in grace through faith, not of works, not in the law, but by faith in Christ. He goes on to sum up some of it here. In chapter 5, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty. Christians are not under the law of Moses. We are under Christ. Stand fast. In, we're not under the law in any kind of law, any kind of written commands. We're not under that. We're under Christ. We are united with Christ. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Free from law. Free from law that has an authority over us that condemn us. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Christ paid for all our sins. We are right with God through faith in him and that alone. Being right with God is what justification is. Being made right, declared right with God. 
Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, that's a commandment that goes all the way back to Abraham, before the law, before Moses, but it's reiterated in Moses. In fact, if you don't keep that commandment, you're cut off from God's people. You either cut your foreskin off or you're cut off from God's people. If you become circumcised, now this, this applies to what's called the uh, Jewish Roots Movement, too. I hope they're not around anymore, but it was a big thing for a while. They were trying to add Christ to the law. That condemns you. Can't do that. If you become circumcised, the teachers were saying you must, you, you believe in Christ. We believe in the substitutionary atonement of Christ, but you must be circumcised also. I'm, I'm sure they went back to Abraham. Circumcision was given to Abraham as a sign and a reminder that he was righteous through circumcision? No. As Paul spells out in Romans, no. Through faith in God. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him, reckoned to him, imputed to him for righteousness, into righteousness. God looking ahead to Christ and his perfect sacrifice. It was a reminder that you're just with God through faith, not works. Because Abraham was reckoned righteous through faith, not works. But then they turn it around into a work. Is there something in human beings? Pride, arrogance, flesh, self-centeredness. Lots of things in human beings. But not, God's not in human beings and unregenerate human beings. Do not become entangled again with a yoke of bondage. The law, the commandments, were referred to as the yoke of the law. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised in order for the purpose of being right with God, just like tithing would come under this too, if you tithe, thinking that you will be more right with God if you tithe, if God will bless you because you tithe, bless you more because you tithe, or he'll curse you because you doubt, then you have put yourself under the yoke of the law, and this is true of you also. Christ will profit you nothing. Christ will profit you nothing. You cannot add any works to the work of Christ because you're saying hit what he did on the cross is not sufficient not sufficient to make me right with God I have to add something his work falls short but my work well I can make up the difference I can top it off if Christ actually didn't accomplish it he fell short Maybe if I add some of my own righteousness to Christ's, then God will receive me. See what you're saying? When you say, I must do this or must do that to be acceptable to God, to be blessed by God, I must tithe. Because, uh, can I say this based on what Paul says here, anathema? The God-damned preacher said it. Because that's what it is. To be anathema is to be damned by God. So if your preacher is preaching, you must do this, and you must do that, and you must do that to be acceptable to God. Piper, in this video that we began looking at, the previous video I'm posting, says there's a whole array of conditions you must meet to be acceptable by God to come into heaven. A whole array of works you must do. 
things you must do to be satisfactory to God, to be welcomed by God. Final salvation. Final justification. The stuff you get here is just, well, not good enough. Believing in Christ Jesus is not good enough to save you. That's what Piper teaches. And again, the word anathema is a command to say, this, let this person be damned by God. Accursed. Because a person accursed by God is damned, condemned. I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised, that one commandment, that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You don't get to pick and choose. You've got to keep it all, all the time. See, by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin, and the wages of sin is death. Cut off from God cut off from a right relationship with God. Christ will profit you nothing. It's either Christ or works. And you, no one was right with God through works. No flesh shall be justified through the works of the law. You have become estranged, separated from Christ by, re by trusting in a work in circumcision in addition to Christ. They weren't rejecting Christ. They were just rejecting the sufficiency of Christ's substitutionary death. Just like Nazarenes. They don't believe that Christ paid the entire penalty for their sins. And they substitute the gos a gospel of entire sanctification. They over Wesley did not make his ministry on that doctrine. That is an errant doctrine of Wesley. But it, it wasn't the foundation of his ministry. They made his errant doctrine the foundation and the reason to be Nazarenes. That is their gospel. Just like speaking in other tongues is the gospel of the Pentecostal movement. It's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a second work of grace, and you don't have the fullness without that. Something else you must do. Or you're not. See, you're not fully Christian. You're just not up to the level of those who can speak in tongues or prophesy. Or It's arrogance and pride. They're the elite. The elite Christians that don't need the Bible. They don't need God's Word. They don't need Christ and Him crucified because they certainly don't talk about Him. Hardly ever. There was all oh, the Spirit told me this, and the Spirit told me that. I saw the a uh, uh, traveling miracle worker. He lengthened somebody's leg. I saw it grow. They saw an illusion. That is not Christ. That is not Christ crucified. If they're, if they're presenting, if they're pointing you to something other than Christ and Him crucified, they are not serving Christ, and it is not the gospel, and it is not the church of Jesus Christ. You are estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law. Justified in part. Let me make this clear again. They were not saying Christ was not necessary. Like, I'm sure it's like the Hebrew Roots Movement, they were saying that Christ is a replacement for the Old Testament sacrifices. He is God's sacrifice. But we also must keep the law. 
or we must keep circumcision, which was given to Abraham. See, we're not trying to keep the law of Moses. We're just trying to obey the command God gave to Abraham. In order to be, if we don't do it, we're not right with God. Even though circumcision was a reminder that justification is by faith, not by works. <coughs> Excuse me. You, you who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. You're no longer in Christ. You've been estranged. You're cut off. What happens to people in that condition? Once saved, always saved? No way. No, you're not saved. You're outside of Christ. You have to be in Christ to be saved. You have to have faith in Christ. You have to belong to Christ. But if you're saying, well, yeah, I believe in Christ, but I need to add something. I mean, taught that I must add this one work of obedience to really be right with God. Otherwise, I'm not right with God. You see how clever Satan is? He doesn't say you have to keep all 613 commandments. You just have to keep this one that was given to Abraham. For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. This is talking about final sanctification, which is at the return of Christ. That is when we are entirely sanctified, when we are conformed to his image, and we are inherently righteous. Even though not because we're not, we're, we're in God's image, in the image of Christ, and connected. We're not separately righteous even then. And the cross does not see a search, a cease to have its effect. The only reason we can be fully conformed to the image of Christ is because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And that's always true of God's blessings, period. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. Okay, <clears throat> this is a passage. Faith working for love is something that Piper wants to do. Working, working, working. Something you must do. The love of God has been poured out in us. The love we have for God, the true love, is a fruit of the Spirit, not a work of man. Faithfulness is a fruit of the Spirit. Long-suffering is a fruit of the Spirit. All these things are fruit of the Spirit. They are a result of what Christ did on the cross. God is our Savior. Salvation is of the Lord, 100%. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. He's calling them to repent. All right. Let's return to Piper's video where he says, we ought not to use the Bible to preach Christ and him crucified. You know, always centering the scripture around Jesus Christ and the cross. So you're preaching, say, uh, Abraham offering his son Isaac up as a burnt offering to God. Say, so you don't want to bring Christ and Christ crucified into that, even though that's what that's all about. God was not asking anything of Abraham that God himself was not willing to do, to sacrifice his only begotten son. Or didn't you see that? Perhaps not, because I've heard 
more than one preacher go through that text and not even mention Christ and the cross. That is utter blindness. That is the blindness of John Piper. And what he's advocating. So let us take a look at his nonsense again, continuing on at 2 minutes and 30 seconds. Let's pray together. Excuse me. Father, my heart's desire now is that your word would be honored. Oh, it, your it name reset would be on me. Something about. Oh, where where am I? Oh, <laughs> excuse me. I somehow I got in the wrong video there. Okay, here we are. Back. I was wondering what. I'm 25 minutes in. I, no. Two minutes and 30 seconds in is where we're picking this up, where we left off. <sighs> I think it tends to weaken the seriousness of practical biblical imperatives on how to live the Christian life in all. Okay, what is weakening the practical biblical imperatives? Remember, cross-centered, Christ-centered preaching going through the text of the Bible, explaining it, and then relating it to Jesus Christ and him crucified. How does this relate to Christ? And I'll say, if you can't relate it to Christ, I don't want to waste my time hearing you. Or you shouldn't be preaching from that text at all. I mean, there's texts in the Bible that aren't about Christ. In the New Testament, James, there is no gospel in James. It's not about the gospel. It's about practical Christian living. It's not the gospel. And it only makes sense in the context of the rest of the New Testament. If you separate that from the gospel, you have nothing. You can't live the Christian life without Christ and him crucified. But the point, is, and if you are believing in Christ, you don't have. It is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do His good pleasure. You don't need instruction in those things, really, because the Holy Spirit teaches you, leads you, guides you. The Father has poured out love in you. These are not things you generate. It's fruit of the Spirit. And the Spirit can only dwell in you because of the cross of Christ. That thrice holy God can only live in you because the temple has been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, you would be unacceptable. You would be a pigsty. And your sin would cause God's wrath to incinerate you. No. The only reason you can sin and survive is because of the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not a one-time thing. It was a one-time thing in 30 or 33 AD. Christ died once for all. Not to be repeated. Never. That's why communion, we don't repeat. We don't re-offer Christ. He was offered once for all, then sat down at the right hand of the Father, having fulfilled his work, having made atonement fully. But for some people, that wasn't enough. Holiness and purity and love by inserting, inserting the substitutionary atonement at critical moments when the emphasis should be falling on the urgency of obedience because that's the urgency of the text. Okay, so we must not let Christ and him crucified keep us from trying to keep the commandments. We must not let, let the cross take the place of our obedience. This was spoken in 2022. 
Was it August? Let me take a look here. No, I don't have that on the screen now. At the uh, the Gospel Coalition. 2020, excuse me, not 2022. 2020. Was it June? Might have been June. Anyway, it was. You could. There's a link right down below here. I don't want to click it now because I'll probably. Uh, let me see here. Can I open a new tab? I think I can get away with that. Here's the message in full. And. June 28th, 2020, exposition or imposition, how gospel-centered preaching can go wrong together for the gospel. And it's based on 2 Timothy 3.16 through 4.2? Really? Now I'm confused. <laughs> really? You know, let, let's see how badly Piper mangled that. Isn't that where, oh, oh my, I know what he did. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable. What did he leave out? What did Piper leave out? 3.16 to 4.2, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Why did the deceiver, why did Satan, because that's who Piper is following, He's a child of Satan doing the deeds of his father, like the Pharisees. What was left out? I mean, this is so clever that this, is, this really has the hiss of the serpent on it. This is how you deceive Christians. Christians are as dumb as sheep. Sheep aren't very smart. They're not that smart. <laughs> okay. So what is, what in context? Oh, yes. Okay, let's go up to, now this is written to, of course, uh, Timothy, uh, who is a Christian, and well aware of Paul's teaching and Paul's emphasis on salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. How do you live godly in Christ Jesus? Through faith in Jesus Christ. That's how do you walk in the Spirit? Through faith in Jesus Christ. How do you walk in obedience? Through faith in Jesus Christ. Not of works. You don't go and say, oh, here's God's commandment, I must do that. No. You look to God to do his work in you. But evil men and imposters, that's who we're talking about here with John Piper, will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, exactly who we're talking about, Piper, deceived and being deceived, deceiving, excuse me, deceiving and being deceived, but you must know, uh, must, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of. What? Salvation by grace through faith in Christ and Christ crucified knowing from whom you have learned, learned them. And from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation, into salvation. It's like the law. The law has a purpose. What? To convict you of your sin, to show you your need for Christ. No one is righteous through the law. No one pleases God through the law. The law says you don't. You, you're not acceptable. You need a Savior. You need a sacrifice, a perfect sacrifice. <sighs> Unless you don't understand the law, like the Pharisees, which are able to make you wise, uh, the word there is ice, I believe, uh, into salvation, through faith, which is in Jesus Christ Jesus. Yeah, so the law points you to Christ. The law talks about the coming one. The prophets speak about the New Covenant. You have to handle the Bible correctly according to the purpose of God, not to impress people with your exegesis of the holiness code in the law uh, about why you can't eat seafood, but you can't have a tattoo. 
I don't know. Uh, people manipulate the law a lot to justify their own sin. It's like a tattoo. Did God tell you to do that? Or are you just doing what your flesh wants to please others? Did you get that to please God? I don't think so. Okay, like even, even the law tells us what's right and what's wrong. There's a reason why, and then some people twist that to satisfy their own desires. Yikes. Where was I? Oh, yeah. All Scripture is, now this is where Piper picks up, all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. The Scripture is, uh, what did Paul, uh, Paul write to Timothy? From, the, from your childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which would have been the Old Testament, uh, because the New Testament wasn't written when Timothy was still a child, a young child, I imagine, which are able to make you wise for or into salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for uh instruction in righteousness. Now, okay, but this is in Christ, not separate from Christ. You cannot use the Bible as something that's separate from Christ. He is the Word of God. I need a production, uh, what do you call a uh, director or something, a button pusher. because I forget to push the button. All Scripture is given, is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. It, but it's all in relation to Christ. There is no righteousness except in relation to Christ, and, and doctrine and teaching and reproof and correction is what? Well, to point you, if you start getting away from Christ, it's all... If, it has the Bible has no purpose other than Christ. He is the center of it all. He's the one that gave it. He is the Word of God. And if you use it for another purpose, you're misusing it. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The only possible good works you can ever do are those that are spirit wrought in you through faith in Christ. If you try to do it by choosing to obey commandments to be right with God, well, you've cut yourself off from Christ. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his uh, kingdom, preach the word, not just because it's a word. Exegeting the scriptures is not preaching Christ. That is not God's purpose. Just to show people how well you understand the Bible. But if you don't understand that it all points to Christ, you don't understand the Bible at all. If you're out there to show off your, your education and your language skills and your knowledge, well, you have your reward. In this life, not the next. <clears throat> you're just using the Bible to say, well, just like Piper, for your own pleasure, your own happiness, your own uh, to satisfy your own desires. Showing off. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. They have no time for that old message of Christ and him crucified. But what will they do? But according to their own desires... And because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. That is exactly what Piper is doing. He is turning people away from the, the gospel to Piper's own corrupt doctrine of hedonism. Piper is nothing but a servant of Satan. 
and let's go back and see some more of that. <laughs> the urgency of the text. In other words, take the section you're preaching on out of the context of all Scripture, out of the story of redemption, out of the story of Christ and Him crucified. Just focus on that and give that to them. The law kills. Commandments kill. They cannot give life. Yeah, it's urgent. Obey it or die. That's what the law says. Obey the law or die. That That's good news? <sighs> the urgency of the text. So, I want to commend to you an alternative to making every text a pathway to the gospel. Did you hear that? I want to commend to you an alternative, another path. Rather than making every text a pathway to Jesus Christ and his salvation. So apparently Piper doesn't particularly like Jesus and the cross. What is going on here? This is an unregenerate person, a servant of Satan, as all unregenerate people are. But he's standing in a pulpit at Together for the Gospel. Well, that's not particularly... Not <laughs> considering what goes on at Together for the Gospel. So how obvious does he have to be? So he's, he's advocating for not, not focusing on Christ, but focusing on, like, commands to obey. Do this, do this, do that, do that. Like the, 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 the books of Moses and the prophets and the two great commandments. Do this or else. Do this or die. That's what the law says. Do it or die. Do it or be damned. Is that good news? Does that give life? No. It's not understanding what those are about anyway. They are to drive you. They're a schoolmaster with a rod to drive you to Christ. You ought to maybe read Pilgrim's Progress. John Bunyan made some of this stuff quite clear in there. <laughs> Apparently it's, it's, it's somewhat of an autobiographical thing, I suspect in the form of a dream. What happens? There's a particular memorable encounter when, when he tries to satisfy, to, to climb up to, to the cross by the works of the law. And what happens? <laughs> he can't do it. And there's, there's flashing of thunder and lightning and he's threatened with destruction. Why? Because he's trying to keep the law. Instead of turning in faith to Christ. Making the mistake of following John Piper and those kind of people. To have Now, let me say, this is at a meeting of Together for the Gospel, and Piper's, what is he doing? He wants them to de-emphasize the Gospel. Who would want to do that? before an audience of preachers. To get the preachers to, to de-emphasize the gospel. Stop trying to make everything about Christ and him crucified. Just let the Bible be about something else. Hmm. <laughs> this isn't funny, but it's either laugh or cry, and I don't feel like crying. I rather feel like mocking. Mocking Piper. Or throwing an well, he is an anthema. He is an anthema. He has anathematized himself for preaching another gospel, the gospel of Christian hedonism. 
which isn't Christian at all. And now he's openly telling people not to proclaim Christ and him crucified consistently, as if you can find churches that do that. They'd be rare. I wish they weren't. the driving question in your sermon preparation be, how can I preach the gospel from this text? I want to wave a yellow flag. Yeah, I sh I'm sure that's um, uh, pointing to the penalty flags in football. Isn't that yellow? Throw a flag. Penalty! So that's, that's a, he's throwing a penalty flag on those who would consistently want to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified, start with the text of Scripture and relate it to Christ and his cross. No, no, no. I want to throw a penalty at you. Penalize you for that. Foul, foul. Ten-yard penalty. I want to Throw up the flag. Penalty on the play. Penalty, 10 yards for preaching a Christ-centered a message, a gospel-centered message, a cross-centered message from, say, Moses, pointing out that the law cannot save you, it only damns you, it's Christ. The law points you to Christ. No, no, you can't do that. No, you must, you must simply communicate the commandments and deceive people that somehow by doing this they can save themselves. By not putting it in the overall context of Scripture. No, no, that's not proper. I'm going to throw a penalty flag at you. Well, guess what? I have uh, an anthema. John Piper, Anathema B. In front of the saying that is so often attributed to Spurgeon, take your text and make a beeline to the cross. Nobody knows. Would that preachers do that. I'd be much happier. I really don't want to hear your exegesis of uh, Ezekiel's vision of the temple and what is it like chapter 40 or 42 of, Z of Ezekiel unless it focuses on Christ I really am not interested unless it's Christ I guess I'm just too in love with Christ and what he did for me to tolerate nonsense and if you treat the Bible in some other way for some other purpose, it is nothing but nonsense. You can take your best life now and choke on it. Joseph Spurgeon said that. <coughs> At least I can't find any Spurgeon scholars who can show that he did, but that doesn't matter. It's not the point. Here's the point. Instead of Okay, what was the purpose of that? It was because Spurgeon is a renowned preacher of Christ and him crucified, of the gospel, a Calvinist that made sure Calvinism stayed in the background rather than the foreground, keeping Christ in the foreground. So, Piper quotes a quote that's uh, attributed to, Pipe, uh, to, uh, to Spurgeon. And then he discredits the quote. In other words, he has to discredit the message, take your text and make a beeline to the cross. Because Spurgeon is a renowned Baptist re Calvinistic preacher, because that's about the only kind there was, other than free will Baptists, which were a mi minority and weird. Uh, in England, these are English Baptists. So, Because Spurgeon focused on the cross and Christ crucified, 
And I'm going to take this quote that's attributed to him, and then I'm going to try to discredit the quote. So to separate the idea of cross-centered preaching from the authority of, of Spurgeon, from Spurgeon, who is a renowned, you know, Piper is nothing. Spurgeon, Spurgeon has still, I mean, the, the, the English newspapers would print Spurgeon's sermons in their newspaper, and Spurgeon didn't have to pay them to do that. He was that popular. His messages were that popular, unlike Piper's. Nobody's printing Piper's. Uh, the New York Times isn't printing Piper's messages free in their paper. Taking your text and making a beeline to the cross, I think you should take the cross and make a beeline to your text. You're being gaslighted. I think that's a proper term. It used to be like brainwashed. You're being gaslighted. Uh, if I understand that right, is basically making a, a person believe they're insane. You take, the, you take what they, they believe they know, and then you convince them they don't actually know that. And you confuse them, and then you tell, then you fill their confused mind with what you want them to believe. It's brainwashing. Uh, just breaking a person, and you're just deconstructing. This, I believe, this is what the transgender movement is about. See, this is satanic. All these things are of Satan. He is the god of this age. He rules over the children of disobedience. So, this transgender movement, what does it do? It denies male and female. It denies uh, a, cr a, truths that are in everybody's face all the time. Almost all animal life, no, almost all life on the planet is gendered, male and female. Even flowers, you've got male organs and female organs. And God made man male and female. In the image of God, he made them. Male and female, he made them. So, when you, if you're able to convince people that there's not just two genders, but say 150 genders, what do you do? You de deconstruct their entire working basis, their entire knowledge of reality falls apart. If, if there's not two genders, in spite of what I constantly see, it's, it's like the, the expression, uh, believe me, don't believe your lying eyes. Don't believe what you see. Don't believe what God says. Believe this nonsense. You're being gaslighted. It, it, the purpose, it, it is not that there are 150 genders. There's only people that make up 150 genders. They invent them. They don't believe in reality. They've been gaslighted. They've been brainwashed so that their mind is not anchored in reality anymore. And once you do that, especially if you're Satan, you can put anything you want. They become a blank slate, a tabula rasa, that you can write whatever you want on. That's the purpose of, of brainwashing is you break people, and then you recreate them. That's the purpose of basic training in the military. You make them do, all, especially in the Air Force. I can't talk about basic in the Army or the Marines because I wasn't there. In the Air Force, most of this stuff is head games. Very little real training. I mean, running a mile and a half in like 13 minutes is not a, is not a real thing. The obstacle course was more like a joke. Uh, really a joke. Most boys get much dirtier playing in their in their backyard than you would on that obstacle course. Uh, anyway, the uh, it's, it's, but they would make you do stupid things like fold your underwear a certain way, fold, uh, f make your bed a certain way. All these stupid little mind games. 
in order to to make you conform to what they wanted you to do so you wouldn't question it teach you to accept what you were told without question now that might be useful in the military but assuming you don't have idiots for commanders now they did have a solution for that in Vietnam it was called fragging bad lieutenant they had a short tour of duty their own troops a, a frag frag is short for a fragmentation grenade so fragging the the lieutenant is rolling a fragmentation grenade into his tent that happened more than once got somebody that's getting their soldiers killed because he's stupid well it's a matter of survival not justifying it but it happens I mean okay I guess that was a rabbit trail unless you want to frag no I'm not even gonna make the suggestion an anthem is sufficient uh, also Piper is uh, well he's on short time anyway so Piper what's gonna happen since he denies that you're saved, that you can enter heaven by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. His two-stage gospel. See, uh, justification only gets you to a level where you can do meritorious works, works of obedience. And then final justification, final salvation, is based on your good works, on your works of obedience, rather than on faith in Christ. Is that another gospel or not? I'll let you that know the scripture answer that. I know the answer to that. That's exactly what Paul was calling another gospel. Only Piper is probably more blatant than those that were misleading the Galatians who earned an anathema. They have cut themselves off from Christ. In fact, anathema means, you know, may God destroy you. Instead of building your sermon toward the cross, build your... No, you know, we don't want to end at the cross. Sermon on the cross. Now, doesn't that sound nice? Build it on the cross. What does that mean? When you say you're not supposed to point to Christ and him crucified, but you're supposed to build it on the cross. That is gaslighting. Instead of preaching biblical imperatives as pointers to Christ's perfection and imputed righteousness. Let me translate. <laughs> Instead of pointing out that the law, the commandments, the purpose of them is to convict you of your sin and point you to the necessity of Christ because the commandments tell you that the wages of sin, the wages of disobedience is death, that the commandments cannot give you life, but they can point you to him who can. Make shows your necessity of a savior, of the cross, of Christ. So rather than that, don't let the commandments point you to Christ's perfection and imputed righteousness. Oh no, not that. I think we should preach imputed righteousness as the power to obey biblical imperatives. There is just enough hint of truth in that to deceive people, especially pastors. Because it is only because of imputed righteousness or God-given righteousness, alien righteousness, that we are able to be justified 
but also sanctified, also filled with the Spirit, all the gifts of the new covenant. But it's through the cross. So when you say build on the cross, but use it as a means to produce obedience. But Piper does leaves it there because, again, his... He does not believe that salvation, final salvation, is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. No, that's only a means to get to a point where you can build the ladder, the final distance to heaven, with your own obedience. Which is also the theology that was being taught in the Auburn Avenue Church and, uh, you know, uh, Doug Wilson, the whole... A thing. There's people better th people than me that can explain that to you uh, that are in the Reform camp about uh, a, well, Wilson's book, a Reform is Not Enough. What they were doing is saying the same thing, that you have to, uh, obedience is part of salvation. With, if you don't have works of obedience, not as fruit, but as Justified, you, you will not be justified. You have to have the works to be justified before God, before God's judgment, see. Not works that show you have faith, but works that are your works. Not fruit, but works. Things that you do out of your own will in order to be justified. See, that's the danger Piper insists you must do these things to be justified rather than if you're in Christ, these things will naturally spring forth out of your life and have nothing to do with your justification, nothing to do with your entrance into heaven. They just display God's works in you, display that you have real faith. They're, they're the fruit of the tree, not the root of the tree. Faith in Christ is and Christ himself is what the, where this springs forth for, from, the new covenant. It's God's work. It is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. Not your work. You don't have to worry about that. That's God's business. He takes care of that. You don't have to get a, a day's agenda from God in the morning. God knows what he's going to do. You just have to, you know... Father, may your will be done in me as it is in heaven. Work your will in me because of what Christ has done for me. Trust in him to do his work in you. You don't need to go figure out what it is and exert. You don't have to break a sweat. Christ did the work. It should come naturally out of you. Not something you have to labor at. You know, people that want to turn, well, uh, Wesley, his holiness clubs, his classes, all these ex uh, exerting yourself to be more holy. It's all the work of the flesh. It's not the work of the Spirit, it's the work of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit, writes Paul in Galatians, and you will not f uh, fulfill the desires of the flesh. Walking in the Spirit is by faith in Jesus Christ. Trusting God to do God's work. <sighs> Piper knows no, Piper's not saved. He's not. As I said, just look at the introduction to Desiring God. If he was saved, he would pull this book off the shelves. Come out and renounce it. Saying, I wasn't saved when I wrote that thing. I didn't know anything. <laughs> Well, if I only could use the right screen here. Or to put it another way, standing on the power and the promises bought for God's elect by the blood of Jesus, wrestle. Wrestle, wrestle with the words. No. <laughs> See, it sounds good. But it's got a little satanic twist to it. 
Uh, standing on the promises, first of all, for, for, for God's elect. No, for, for the believing ones. Piper doesn't like the word believing. Faith alone. Who are the elect? Those who believe in Christ. Those who trust Christ. That's the elect. You will never find the word elect used, at least the English word elect. I didn't go through all of them. In the New Testament, in regard to people that are non-believers, that haven't believed yet. No, the elect are those who believe. <laughs> at least if you define it based on how it's used in the New Testament. Yeah. Calvinists have a different definition that goes back much farther to pre-creation and eternal decree uh, of both salvation and damnation. Wrestle with the... But, see, that, see Piper is not a Calvinist. He, he's, he's certainly not consistent with Calvinist doctrine either, so he's, he's just servant of Satan. That's what he's doing right here. And spinning the words. So wrestle, wrestle with the words. And phrases and sentences and flow of thought in the text. Wrestle with them until you see show it to your people. And show them how Excuse and then me, I think offer I it to them. Offer it to them as a blood bought gift, urging them with all your might to see it and understand it and embrace it and be glad in it and obey it. And die without Christ. To separate God's Word from the Word of God, who is Christ himself. And what his purpose was, is to destroy the Scriptures. It is the ultimate corruption of Scripture. To use the Bible for other purposes than preaching Christ and Him crucified. And multitudes of pastors do this constantly. Five steps to a happier marriage. Ten steps to a better career. Whatever. How to be fulfilled. How to have a purpose-driven life, a life of purpose, a life of fulfillment, a life of happiness. That's not what the Bible's about. And if you use it to teach those things, you have corrupted the Scriptures, because that's not their message. You have misused the Scripture. And share it. Let the reality of the text be the crescendo of the sermon. I learned some words at General Motors that I'd like to use right now. I think anathema is probably better, though. If Christ and Christ crucified is not the crescendo of the scripture, at least prior to his return, what is? All pointed toward that. All the promises point and are grounded in him. And to end with something other than Christ and him crucified is a sin against Christ and his people. You are leaving them empty with twisted scripture for lunch or Sunday dinner. Mangled scriptures. Cold slaw. Chopped scripture. Purposeless. <sighs> Apparently that's the end. Rethinking cross-centered preaching. Yes, we must not do that. 
Oh, let's do this Easter Bunny instead. <laughs> oh, and there, then there is, uh, what's his name over here? There's another Bible twister. Uh, uh, Piper is uh, not a servant of God. No way. No, he's not. Uh, no. If your church does not preach Christ and him crucified, if, if, you know, if, 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 he, if it's about something else, consistently about something else, why are you going there? I don't care what they have in their statement of faith. Why are you going there? If you can't go there and listen to a sermon on a regular basis and it's about all about Christ and what he's done for us, exactly why are you going there? Just because it makes you feel good because the preacher tells you how wonderful you are or gives you uh, advice on how to live your life? Why are you putting money in the offering plate? Is that for God or for you? Because you like what's being preached there. You like the way they tickle your flesh, pat your, your flesh, and tickle your ears. And that, the tingling of the flesh, oh, wow. God says I'm so wonderful. I'm so wonderful that Christ died for me. God values me so much. You're not worth a thing. Except God chose to send his son to die for you. People are not precious. As, as John the Baptist said to the Jews that were trusting in their ancestry, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. If you like people telling you what you want to hear, well, you have your reward. For those who would rather hear about Jesus Christ and what he's done for us, I can't tell you where to go other than to the scriptures and look at what they say about Christ and him crucified. Because I only know of one, one church around here where I've heard that Christ and him crucified consistently preached. And they won't let me become a member there. <laughs> because I won't swallow the book of Concord. Uh, anyway, that's probably unique to that particular minister, too. Yeah, he's very good at whatever he's preaching. In fact, he was preaching out of James, and he managed to bring Christ and Christ crucified in. And I was talking to him. He said, yeah, I didn't know how I was going to do that. He figured out how to do it. Yeah, he always has to get Christ and Christ crucified in there. Thumbs up. Even if I can't become a member of that church because of the rules of the denomination. Uh, Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. And some of the stuff is pretty... You know, some of the stuff is sort of weird, but but still, I'm talking about the preaching, the ministry of the Word. Yeah, Christ and Christ crucified. So, at least the ones I heard. Anyway, uh, you know, this, this is the darkness that's in the world today. We should be perhaps less concerned about the, the garbage in Washington, D.C., and more concerned about the garbage that is served to us in what claims to be the Church of Jesus Christ. You know, even if you're part of a church that does is not a congregational church, you always have the decision about what you put in the offering or what you don't put in the offering. Vote with your pocketbook. If you don't like what they're preaching, Give them something worthless. <laughs> like a note that says your preaching sucks because it's not Christ and him crucified. And this is what you're going to get in the offering plate until you change. Something like that. Or a, a slug 
you know, the, the fake pe the pieces of metal that sometimes are thrown into vending machines instead of real money. Something that shows your esteem for his message quietly. Or you could just tell him what you think. <sighs> because don't, don't encourage him in what he's doing. That would be a sin against God. Don't support people that preach lies. Don't. If you're going to buy their books, buy them used on Amazon so they don't get royalty. But I wouldn't buy their books in for, for the purpose of listening to the person and believing what he's telling you because he's not speaking for God. He's speaking for the enemy of God, like John Piper is. Well, that's enough of that a little less than a six-minute video. It only took almost two hours, and I can do more on it because this is, this is in-your-face apostasy. We live in the last days, brothers and sisters. The darkness. The enemy is not outside the gates trying to get in. They own the gates. They are inside what call, is calls itself the church. They are standing in the pulpits. They, get, they are the big names in evangelicalism today. And they can preach a false gospel, and nobody notices. That's how bad the situation is. Nobody even notices, but rather they're applauded and made into heroes. Well, even if I'm the only one that condemns Piper, so be it, because he is an anthema. And he continues to be, because this was only two years ago at the Gospel Coalition. Well, come quickly, Lord Jesus, because the lights are really going out in this world. 